You're listening to the Race at a Racer podcast presented by Race 92. Race 92 is a vintage inspired racing apparel brand specializing in celebrating vintage race culture and adapting to motorsports today. Check out race92.com for all your racing. Re- I, I just messed that up. I don't know what I was doing. Hold on a second. What did I just do? Check out Race 92. Man, I've done this a million times. All right, we're good. Start over. This, this, this is going to be our best intro ever. It is. Yeah. You're listening to the Race to Racer podcast presented by Race 92. Race 92 is a vintage inspired racing apparel brand specializing in celebrating vintage race culture and adapting to motorsports today. Check out race92.com for all your racing merchandise needs. I'm your co host, Aaron Mack. To other co host, you may have seen walking out of a great club with a big old smile on his face. You've probably seen him at a dirt track. And actually, last week, I saw you in a drive through line. Yes. <laughs> He's the yes, one and did. only Scott Bowie. We, uh, Aaron and I have a conversation. And uh, he goes, I'm, I'm not going to go to such and such place. I thought, man, that sounds pretty good. I show up at the drive through and guess who's sitting right in front of me? Me. It, Aaron. You know, it's kind of like, you know, always hear people say like on Sundays, like, you know, don't go to the restaurants at noon or whatever, because that's when church lets out or, you know, stuff like that. And it's kind of the same situation. Like when the race, <laughs> racer podcast lets out, you may find us at a restaurant near you. That's right. This, that's the second time this has happened, by the way. It is. Second time. And second I think the time. first time I actually told you where I was going to. So I think you're just following I, me around. I, I stalked you the first time. To. Yeah, absolutely. The second time you lied to me trying to throw off the scent. But I tracked you down anyway. <laughs> you, know you can you're you're like a hound dog. You can smell That's you right. can smell me. <laughs> but um, uh, but yeah, no. But th- thanks everyone for watching and listening. If you haven't already, make sure you hit like and subscribe on YouTube, and also check us out on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Which brings me to another point. Um, my dad had a conversation this past weekend with someone. I think of the, that retirement party at your work or whatever and told someone to subscribe and they were like, well, doesn't that cost money to just, just subscribe? No, it does not cost money. So make sure you subscribe. <laughs> yeah, but, it was, uh, he went to, unfortunately I was unable to go, but a uh, little behind the scenes baseball for everybody. I actually work with uh, Aaron's father at uh, in my real world. Not my play world of Racer <laughs> Racer. Hey, and, Scott, uh, all Scott Bowie's life is a play world, right? Yeah, right. And uh, and one of uh, the finest people I've ever worked with, Nellie Sox, was retiring. And unfortunately, I couldn't go. He was there. And uh, so big shout out to Nellie. Uh, huge fan of Nellie. She took me under, my, un, under her wing, excuse me, when I, I first started working there. And helps me reacclimate back into society from living a racer lifestyle. And uh, I, that's, that's kind of a joke, but she really did help me where I'm working now was a huge part of me being able to secure the job there. So um, anyway, happy, uh, happy retirement to Nelly. Uh, but yeah, it's free to subscribe and please, uh, if you, you know, if you're on a long car trip or something and, you know, obviously you can't really watch our episodes, please listen to them um, and please give us feedback on what we could do to be better. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, a lot of people have been leaving a lot of comments recently, like on YouTube. And um, it's really cool. You know, people say they enjoy the show and, you know, ask different things. And I know we talked about this in the past, but, you know, maybe in the future we'll find some other ways to kind of engage with people. I know we've talked about doing a couple other things, so. Um, we'll definitely think about that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I really do want to start trying to figure out how to uh, meet the people who watch and listen and, and engage these people and, and, you know, say thank you to them in person because it, it means a lot. I mean, it, it, to me, it means a lot. Oh, absolutely. It definitely means a lot to me. And the, we've talked about this before, but the first time anyone kind of recognized, I guess me for really, it was the only time. And it was early. I mean, it was early on into the podcast. It was like our first month in. Um, someone came up to me at the track and asked if I was with the Race to Racer podcast, which was really cool. Um, we talked about that. We joked about that with Paul Page a little bit. Obviously, completely different deals there. But, um, you know, it was, it, was, it was a cool experience. So, um, you know, definitely look forward to other people, hopefully, 
you know, kind of recognized in the show. Um, and, you know, our numbers are going up. Our subscribers are going up. So I think that's definitely a good thing. Yeah, I I, I agree. I, I I just, uh, again, I've said it many times before. I know it sounds probably sounds fake to people, but I really do appreciate it. And thank you so much for doing it. And thank you for listening and watching. Oh, absolutely. So our show today is none other than Kristen Fittipaldi, which was absolute pleasure to record. And, um, you know, just a great guy, you know, absolute racing legend comes from a family that's just iconic with motorsports. Yeah. And, uh, I, it was a really, um, I, I wouldn't say more of a serious interview, but I, you know, Christian, um, really just kind of told us how he thought of his career and, and, um, you know, just talked a lot about his career and, and obviously cause he's on the show, but it was just, uh, I don't know. It, it wasn't, I can't say it was different than I thought it would be, but he was pretty introspective and, and, uh, it was a great talk and, um, you, you know, you find out more about Christian's life and, and his racing and it, it was, it was a really good talk. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, definitely one of the more iconic drivers really from the nineties and someone who drove a one Indy 500. And I mean, he finished second, right? It was second. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And, and again, and, you know, like so many drivers, right. That just the timing of everything, just, um, how the world worked out, you know, yeah. Absolutely. But yeah, so, great guy. I mean, very nice, very kind. <laughs> um, and definitely somebody we're going to have back. Yep. We've already um, talked about having a part two, so that definitely will be coming sometime once we get that recorded. But he, he definitely, um, he, he brought it up himself. We want to do a part two, so it's pretty cool and definitely looking forward to it. And we actually left on the cliffhanger on um, your best racing story. So I have a feeling this is going to be a good one. Yeah, and I don't ask that question often. I, I like to ask it to people who've had a really uh, long and wide career. So, uh, in fact, we just asked it of, of the guests we just got into talking to. So, and it was a good story. Absolutely. Yeah. Really good story. Yeah. Absolutely. It actually went a lot different than what I thought he was going to say. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but, um, but no, yeah. Thanks everyone for listening. And um, so next week we're doing something a little different. So we're starting a series. Um, for the, they'll be over the next two weeks. Uh, it'd be three shows a week of women in racing. And we have some drivers and some PR, you know, PR person and, and um, some things like that. And, and, you know, these are not the most known people you could go after. These are um, either drivers who are still trying to work their way through the sport. There's a, there's a team owner in one. Uh, there's, I mean, there's just various people. And, um, so this is something I, I'm really happy to be able to do. And, and uh, I, hopefully we can do it again next year. And, uh, hopefully this become kind of, a, and it's like I said, it's not that we're not going to interview, um, women in racing. Cause we'll, we definitely want to talk to women in racing, but we have, we thought that, this. Yeah, so I thought this was just a really good way to kind of carve out um, a specific time and specific shows toward that, though. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, mean, I guess we want to say a little bit about some of the people. So we'll, we'll say at least the first one. So the first person we interview is um, Katie Dugas, who she's actually, you know, done some racing. She's been in racing for a while. She owns Dirt Modifieds. Um, but she's also the PR person and um, she owns his race cars as well of John Schneider, who we've also had on the show, um, obviously Bo Duke from Dukes to Hazard. And, um, you know, he just started racing, I think just in the past couple of years. So it's cool kind of hearing her talk about that. And also, you know, some of her um, just experiences of racing in general. And, you know, obviously we'll talk about that a little bit before we interview her in the intro for that episode. Um, but that will be the first one. And that will be released. Like we said, Next week, probably, probably looking at Monday. I think we're doing we're doing Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Probably, Is yeah. It? Some of it's still up in the air, but yeah, probably start that one on Monday. Right. 
Um, and as far as yeah, racing I, news, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, she. No, I was gonna say it was a great talk, and and um, yeah, I just enjoyed meeting her, and hope hopefully we'll meet her uh, in person here at, toward the end of June. We're trying to set something up then. So, yeah, absolutely, definitely looking forward to that. Um, but as far as racing news, there's really not a whole lot. A lot of series were off. Um, NASCAR was at Richmond, and Denny Hamlin won. Yeah, I did Denny Hamlin. Um, I di- I didn't get a chance to watch any of it, um, but just kind of reading, uh, like Darren Gilliam and Black Flags Matter, and some of the other people. Uh, Darren is Black Flags Matter, but some of the other people in the sport just talked about it. It was more of a strategy type race. Again, didn't see it. Um, sure. I-, I guess some people say, "Ah, oh, wasn't exciting." Well. It wasn't exciting because there wasn't a lot of crashes, I guess. I don't know, you know, which I think is ridiculous. But, um, but anyway, Denny Hamlin putting one on the scoreboard, but it had been a really tough year for him. He's now locked into the playoffs. And he, you know, he's always competitive, and I think he will be competitive till till the day he retires. And his team obviously is, you know, competitive now too. I mean, the team that he started, obviously. But I always saw that was a weird deal. As soon as that started, I was like, "How's that working?" Like he's driving for another team, and he owns a different team. But in a way, Casey right. Kane was doing the same thing last year with World of Outlaws. Well, in a way, with uh, Jeff Gordon was kind of doing that at Hendrick. I mean, he drove for Hendrick, but he was listed as one of the owners for Jimmy Johnson's car. It's true. So it's it's definitely not unprecedented. Um, I got to do some kind of fun this weekend. Uh, Saturday, I went out to Graham Ray Hall's. Um, not in any type of official capacity with the show. Just went out to enjoy uh, their cars and coffee uh, show car thing. Man, if you're around Indy and you get a chance to go to one of those at Graham's, some of the most beautiful exotic cars you've seen. Uh, there was, I didn't see McLarens, but I did see uh, Lamborghinis, high-end Porsches, high-end uh, Mercedes. A uh, ton of people brought their cars out. Um, Graham's got a, a really great shop where they do work on cars and uh, on those types of cars. And um, he's got a Ducati dealership right there as well. Beautiful bikes. In, in the lobby, you know, uh, for sale. Um, so if anybody gets a chance, stop by those facilities because they're really nice. And uh, Graham and his wife were there and their, their kid uh, were just walking around like normal business owners. And, and uh, you, you know, it was really, I, Rob and I were talking, it was really nice to see them kind of living their best life, right? I mean, they they got this business, and and this business means a lot to him. If you listen to him talk about it, and and they're both there, just you know, really working it, and it's it's good to see. You know, he, he can it gives you a good insight into the kind of guy that Graham Ray Hall is, and the kind of person his wife is. Oh, absolutely. So, and I actually did buy a Graham Ray Hall. I don't know if you can see the logo shirt. If anybody knows me, buying t-shirts is something of race teams is something i don't do at full price so if i do it at full price that means that i actually had a good time and i did by not by a full price you mean when it's free you buy right. when it's, uh, most when of the time, it's free. I'll, I'll buy some i'll buy racing shirts in the uh <laughs> in the uh quote-unquote cutout bin you know like mm-hmm. uh three for ten or whatever um i got a ton of my shirts that way um, but if I buy your stuff at full price, that means that I've had a really good time. So, and I did. Absolutely. Well, um, you know, once again, you know, we appreciate everyone watching and, and listening. And yeah, I mean, I, I would say the past, the past week we recorded four former Indy 500 starters and very diverse drivers as well, drove in many different things. Two of them have a pretty big sports car pass. So, um, you know, Definitely look forward to releasing those. Definitely um, r- really good interviews. A really fun week last week and today. Yeah. No, it, yeah. I mean, we've got tons and tons of really great interviews coming up. Um, and like I said, uh, the 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 shows with the, the women in motorsports, I feel, are great. So um, please check them out if you get a chance. Absolutely. And um, special shout out once again to racercollect.com. Patrick, 
great friend of the show. He helped set up one of the women in motorsports. So definitely, um, yeah, check out racercollect.com if you're looking for any racing memorabilia. And yeah, thanks everyone again. And um, definitely tune in next week for our special women in motorsports um, episodes. And hope everyone enjoys. Thanks, everybody. Our guest today has driven in Formula One, IndyCar, NASCAR, and IMSA. He was a 1995 Indianapolis 500 Rookie of the Year, finishing second in the race. He's also a three-time 24 Hours at Daytona winner and a two-time IMSA sports car champion. We're joined by Kristen Fittipaldi. Kristen, thank you so much for joining us. Um, like, <clears throat> like I was telling you, Daytona, I'm, I'm a big fan. I actually have one of your driver's suits. I, I think I have a, a visor and gloves, so it's really cool to actually um, you know, get to talk to you on the show. Oh, thank you. Uh, pleasure is all mine. I'm pretty happy to be here with you guys. And uh, I'm sure that we can bring up a lot of crazy stories uh, throughout the, these, all, all these years I've been racing, and uh, especially the last couple of years, which uh, was full-time IMSA. And you raced, it was 38 years, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, what a what a great career for sure. So talk a little bit about how you first got interested in racing. Obviously, everyone's familiar with your, you know, your family's history in racing. Um, but what was kind of your earliest memory of racing and how did you get interested? Well, I guess um, no need to say that uh, indirectly I was always uh, involved with it because of my dad, because of my uncle. Um then going to school, I remember in, in uh, my, my early ages, um, when I was together with my little buddies and, and uh, like the teacher and, and she would come up to us and, and she would say, okay, what does your dad do? Then one said, ah, oh, my dad works in a bank. Then the other one uh, answered, what does your dad do? And then the other one said, ah, he works in real estate business. And then when it came up to me and, and they asked me, what does your dad do? And I was probably in third, fourth grade. Uh, I looked at them and I said, ah, he has a Formula One team, as if it was the, the, the most normal thing on the face of the planet. And then <laughs> now I realize <laughs> um, what a mess I was getting into. Um, but I guess it, it pretty much developed from there. And um, it got really serious when I started doing the world championships in karting. Uh, about uh, 110, 115 drivers, of which only 33 of those go, go to, the, to the real final to see who's going to win the thing. And then the others are, are eliminated. They go back home. And um, when I got to that stage, I said, wow, this is this is getting pretty serious. And then uh, I started getting more and more into it, more involved. And I guess it just developed from there. I started racing cars when I was 17 and it kept on going. And uh, as you mentioned, Aaron, um, that took 38 years of my life. What, um, so what would you say was your, like, did you have an initial racing goal? Like, was it a race in Formula One? Um, the first, first goal was never, I, I guess we're, we're kids. And when we're kids, like 11, 12, 13 years old, mm -hmm. we want to have fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think like, although I would answer people when they ask me, oh, what do you want to do when you grow up? Oh, be a Formula One driver and this and that. But maybe deep inside my heart, I really didn't mean it. I just wanted to have fun. <laughs> <laughs> and and again as as it started like progressing throughout the years and started getting more and more complex then i got to the point that yeah wow this is really cool and uh like i loved what i was doing and yes the, I, I was trying by all means to to uh get to formula one uh, one day at uh, what point did you were you able to kind of like you could finally see the light at the end of the tunnel and you're like, man, this I can achieve this dream. Like this can really happen. Yeah, that's a good question. I think it started sinking in. Um, in those days, you needed what they call I don't, I don't even know if they need, if they use it anymore nowadays, which was something called the super license. 
Mm-hmm. And in order for you to get a super license, you needed to win a FIA championship. And uh, I guess when I won the FIA Formula 3 Brazilian championship, um, then it really started sinking in because that happened in 1990, I think it was. And and if you stop to think, like uh, probably a little bit more than a year later, I was driving, I was driving a Formula 1 car, which... My first test in a Formula One was in Paul Ricard in uh, January '92. So I guess when I when I won the championship and I knew I had the 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 FIA Super License, I said, "Wow, I'm, I'm, I, I I couldn't basically say, okay, I'm going to make it to Formula One at that stage because I still needed to go Formula." Uh, 3000, which was the access series to Formula One. But I, I knew I was really, really close. And, and answering your question directly, I guess it started really sinking in uh, at a, pretty much at that point. How old were you when you first got into your first F1 race? 20, what was it? Well, 92 to 90, yeah, 21, 21. Wow, wow. Yeah. It seems so young, but, I mean, it's really not in racing terms, especially today. Well, especially today, yeah. Spe- yeah. yeah, exactly. Like, uh, I think you two just mentioned on, 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 on something pretty important. Nowadays, it isn't uh, very, very young, like especially today. But in those days, it was extremely young. And if I could backtrack everything... Uh, I wish I could have started Formula One maybe two or three years later because when you're hoovering around 2021, every year makes a big difference in maturity. And I really don't think I would have gotten any faster or slower. (laughs) Uh, Like, I, I think the speed was there. I had what I had. But I think that my approach to the sport maybe would have been a little bit different and uh, that would have helped me a little bit throughout my racing career. Okay. I want to, I want to seize on that for a second. And when you say your approach, um, are you talking about like, because it's so hard, especially for, I can only imagine being a young guy, young, good looking guy, famous last name. And, you know, now you're driving an F1. I mean, man, that's that'd be hard to juggle. I mean, that's a, that's hard to juggle. I would think. Yeah, like uh, you hit on a pretty interesting uh, point. Obviously, um, the name helped me. There's no doubt about it. It opened a lot of doors for me. But at the same time, I always carried a lot of weight uh, on my back. Sure. And sure. When when Christian finished the race in second, he didn't finish the race in second. He lost the race. Right. So th- th- that was something that, like, I had to deal with throughout my racing career. And the conclusion I got to this issue was trying to use the positives to my advantage and sort of put the negatives to sleep and, and sort of not think so much uh, on the negatives and, and only try to use the positives uh, to my advantage. But um, sometimes it helped me, and sometimes it was it was, was very, very hard for me. Well, I would just think it would attract so much attention um, just from – just like you said, first of all, you're carrying that weight. And people may not realize that, but you are inside. And But then on top of that, then, of course, you're very recognizable because of that. So then you have, you know, various fans, people obviously with expectations, you know, just fans with expectations. And I'm sure coming up to you, um, I mean, that to me, that seems like they'd just be very hard, um, you know, to juggle that along with trying to get your feet under you as a, as a new driver in F1. Yeah, I guess. I guess you're right about it, but um, 
I had what I had. So <laughs> like, it's not that I could pick and then say, okay, I want to have a little bit of right. this from that guy, a little bit of that from the other guy. And, and then I want to use it to my advantage all the time. Like, it, right. and unfortunately it doesn't work this way because if it worked this way, I'm pretty sure everyone would be successful in, in their own little niche, like in their own little, right. little business, uh, whatever they do. Um, yeah. So it, it just went the way it went. And, um, like, what can I say? Do I, do I have some regrets? Uh, I'm not going to lie to you. Maybe yes. But I think everyone in life has regrets. And, and I think that's part of life. It's, it's yeah. living the, the living and learning system. And, and uh, like, we're having this, this conversation in, in three. Like, if I ask you two, if you say, if you two answer me that you have zero regrets of everything you did in life, you would probably be lying to me. Absolutely. I got six regrets from today. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know. When you started, um, so your first year in Formula One, I mean, obviously you're racing against some of the greatest drivers of all time. Did, did you have a, like, you know, I ask this a lot to IndyCar drivers, like, did you have a welcome to the big leagues moment? Like, was it maybe getting to race with Ayrton Senna or did you have a moment well, where you're just like, man, I'm racing, you know, in the big yeah. leagues? Yeah, it's, I, I think part of that backtracks a little bit to my, one of my regrets. Like, I think my approach to the sport was, was very nimble, was very, was very gentle. And I remember when I did my first picture in South Africa and th that picture that they do of all the drivers at the beginning of the season. And like, uh, I looked around and I turned my head to the right. Uh, Ayrton was, was pretty much next to me or, or two guys from me, whatever. And then I turned my head to the left or, or look a little bit downwards and I see Manso like, so yeah, I'm not going to say that you don't get intimidated. Right. You, you do. And, and, I think it's part of the the natural process of of like um, how can I say living and learning and 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 mm -hmm. maturing and and all that stuff and and uh, I if I could go back again I, I think that one was one of my biggest hurdles uh, that I had but um, again like uh, it is what it is and. Um, we can't change the past and we can maybe change the future. So <laughs> it, there's not a lot to say. It, it was the way it was. There were a couple of times throughout my racing career. I think I was a little bit unlucky. And I, I think that if something which had nothing to do with, with talent or, or, or mechanical issues or the race team or whatever, if, if something had spun a little bit different and, and I had that little touch of luck, like in that situation, you know how it is in life. Like it's, it's, it's one little thing that triggers a bunch of others and, and maybe it, w it, w it would have triggered like everything uh, in a different way. But um Again, like we could spend the whole night here talking about ifs, 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 and but unfortunately, ifs don't exist. So that's it. <laughs> right. at, at what point did you kind of um, think about you know starting a career over in America? Um, after my third year in Formula One, basically, what happened is uh, all the big guns had had contracts. Uh, mm -hmm. already in place for them to continue with the big teams and I had the option of continuing with, with a medium team or going to McLaren to be tester for them in those days being a tester or being a, a, a test driver wasn't okay it didn't mean that you were going to make it into a, a full-blown race car like there, there, were, there were a bunch of guys that were test drivers for 20 years or not 20 years, but a bunch of years and, and ne never made it to, to a race car. So uh, although you would be associated with McLaren, it didn't necessarily mean that I would get 
a uh, a race seat, and and uh, Ron told me that. Um, but he still offered me the job, and and then I said, I, I remember very well. It was uh, Monza '94, and then I was with my dad there, and I said, "Man, what are we gonna do? Like, uh, we're gonna spend another year here." like dreaming of maybe doing this doing that and and then i said why don't we go to indycar do a season in indycar and then come back over here and then he said yeah we could do that so i came to indycar i started racing with uh, walker and in the middle of the season my opportunity to go to newman haas um uh, appeared, uh, arose, and and then I signed my first contract with Carl. <clears throat> that was a, a three year contract, and after I got to the end of that three years, I re signed for another two years. So, <laughs> pretty much when I look back, five years of my life had gone by, and I pretty much lost the bus, like in in, in Formula One, like it, it had gone by, and and. And, and that was it. Like, uh, although my intentions were to come to Indy only to race for one season and then go back again, uh, it didn't happen that way. But again, am I going to pinpoint that to the regret category? No, uh, by no means. It, it's exactly what I just said. It, it just happened uh, in a different way, period. <laughs> Yeah, and then you, you came along at a kind of a rough time in the sport too. You got what one Indy you got to run Indy once, right? Ninety five? Yes. Yeah. I did ninety five, yeah. And then and you ran second. Am, am I right in that? Yes. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, no, and in that race, uh, Jacques won Jacques won the race. I finished second and uh, Bobby yeah. Bobby finished third right behind me. What you, was uh, that? Um, I was going to yeah. say, what, what was that experience like for you? I mean, to race the Indy 500. I'm guessing that was probably, I mean, you've obviously been in some big races before that, but I mean, what, what was that experience like for you? Yeah, that's a pretty interesting question because I only realized what was the Indy 500 when I went by um, Gasoline Alley going to the car uh, for pre-grid like when the car was on the grid because as soon as i came onto the track i looked to the right and i looked to the left and wow i've never seen so many people together in my whole entire life like there, there was what probably i don't know three hundred thousand people there and it, it it was huge and i think that was uh, uh beneficial to me during the month of may because I was in Indy, and to me, that was a race like any other. Yeah, I, I wasn't thinking about it as the Indy 500, oh, the Indy, the Indy, I need to drink the milk, and this and that. I, I was taking the approach of let's go racing and and uh, let's try and get the best out of it. And, and obviously, the best out of it was to try and win. Um, so I think that was – that really worked – to my advantage, um, and I only sort of only really sunk in what the Indy 500 was after the race, and uh, after I finished second, and then the award ceremony on Monday. So th th that's exactly when when I, I I think it really sunk in, and wow, the, I was runner up at the Indy 500. I was rookie of the year, and I almost won the thing on my first attempt. Yeah, and it's such a crazy time. Then all of a sudden, split comes. You're, yeah. you, you know, you're obviously signed to do something else, and you never got to run there again. I mean, I know, and it's it, that's uh, man, that's just that's crazy. And obviously, you, you know, obviously, you're not the only one. You know, somebody like PJ Jones, who who his entire life running Indy was all he wanted to do and he didn't get to do it. And then, um, you know, Zanardi and, and just, it's man, I, I understand what happened, but kind of sad. 
Yeah. Um, I guess it, I, I guess it was sad. Sorry, guys. Are you good? Oh, you're fine. Here. No. <sighs> How can I say, man? I guess it was sad, but it's, it's the way the thing, the thing happened. And, and, right. and, and, and there's no rights and wrongs. There was a lot of politics involved and mm-hmm. a lot of egos involved. <laughs> and uh, I think that the sport lost a lot. And IndyCar entity. Now, uh, let's sort of put aside IRL, CART. I'm saying ju- just look at it as IndyCar, You're like single seater automobile racing in this country. I think IndyCar lost the most. And who gained the most with that was NASCAR. <laughs> right. So, uh, what are you going to say? Like, uh, uh, again, it's what we started when when we started talking about my regrets and my the beginning of my racing career and all that stuff. I'm pretty sure that we can spend our whole nights talking about this or that, or if it wasn't for this, if it wasn't for that. But um, again, we can't no. go back. Yeah. In those, uh, it, but Cart was strong. It, you know, for several years afterwards, and uh, you uh, ended up having a great career in cart. Um, and kind of just tell us a little bit about that time, and how did that? How did running in cart at that time? How did it compare to F one at that you had already done? Um, you know, because at the time, cart was big. Um, so it's just. It's just interesting to see how somebody who did both at that time period would compare the two. Well, um, the first time I drove a champ car or a cart uh, car, whatever we want to call it, uh, was in Sebring in the beginning of uh, 95. And, and I hopped in the car and I, I was impressed. Yeah, it was. Was it as as nimble and and as fast on change of directions and 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 depending which corner you were going into as a Formula One car? No, it wasn't. Was was it fast on the straight? Yes, it was. And and the thing that I was impressed the most, although we didn't use carbon brakes, only on super speedways, uh, I was impressed with with. The braking power, like the, the the cars had gigantic rotors on, and 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 all that stuff. Like it, it, for for being uh, for not being a, a carbon for a carbon braking car, like it it braked very very well. Uh, but again, was it a little bit heavier in, in some situations? Did it accelerate a little bit less coming out of the turns? Yes, it did. But uh, I would say that it was um, on a road course, it was pretty much like 90% of the performance of a Formula One car uh, in those days. Um, if we're going to put super speedways and ovals in the mix, obviously that comparison we can't do because Formula One's you know, Formula One, they don't race on those type of tracks, but uh, I'm pretty sure that an Indy car would kill a Formula One car on a super speedway or 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 like uh, any other type of Volvo. Oh, sure. Um, but that's a different type of racing, and 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 it's even hard for you to compare what what it is to run on a super speedway. Uh, compared to what Formula One does on, on road courses and, and uh, street courses. So before you came over to America, you probably never raced in any kind of oval before, right? No, zero. Zero. I had never been on an oval before. So what was that? I mean, what was that like to just to jump right? And I think your first oval probably would have been like Phoenix, maybe? Oh, very good. It was a Phoenix test mm-hmm. and uh, Phoenix race. Yeah, exactly. So I'll tell you a funny story. So I arrive at the, my first Phoenix test and 
And then I see the headrest on the side of the car. And, <laughs> and then I ask the guys, like, why do you need a headrest? Like, I, I just arrived from Formula One. I have this very strong neck. And, and uh, I'm pretty sure that you don't need a headrest. So they looked at me as if I was going crazy or something like that. And I said, no, 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 it's okay. I don't need a headrest. Like, take it out of the car. Okay. So we took the headrest off. I go out. I do my first run like I did three, four laps. Probably the lap time there was 20 seconds. I was running it in 25 seconds after about five laps, eight laps, whatever. <laughs> so then I stop. We, we check all tire pressures and all that stuff. Oh, everything okay, everything okay. So then I go out, do another bunch of laps. I come back in after another set of 10 laps because my neck was completely gone. And um, I was still running like 23 seconds. Like I was pretty much like three seconds off the pace. My neck was already gone. <laughs> and, and I still needed to go three seconds faster than that. So I very, very fast came to the conclusion that I was pretty much daydreaming that I would be able to drive a Indy car with no, uh, with no headrest. So back to the garage, stick the headrest in the car and then, and off I go. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny because we, we talked to Pete Halsmer who drove Indy cars back in the eighties. And he was saying like his first ever oval, he like, I think he said 25% of the race, he was driving with one hand and had one hand on his head because he just physically couldn't keep it up. So I can't even imagine. I mean, the amount of G's that are being exerted yeah. on your neck, it's just gotta be crazy. Well, it's, it's not, uh, I think the big difference from Formula One is that Formula One, you have some very high peak Gs, but they're only for a second, a second and a half at the most. If you get like uh, turn three and four in Phoenix, from the time you go into turn three until the time you exit turn four, I don't know, you're pretty much throughout the whole corner about what, four or five seconds, like in, in the corner. And your like sustained G's are very, very high. So when you add up those four, four or five seconds on one side, plus like three, four seconds on the other side of the turn, and the resting time that you have from one side of the track to the other is very little. So your neck is going to get demolished it, like very, very fast. And that's pretty much what happened. But I, I learned my lesson very, very quick. <laughs> so, what'd you, what'd you think of uh, Michigan the first time you saw it? Uh, big, uh, intimidating because of the banking. Uh, and I remember what Eddie Cheever told me, I'll never forget, which he was right. He said, try to use, don't think about the banking as, as a corner. Use it to your advantage. Like run high, run low. The banking is your friend and you get extra grip from it. Um, and then he said, imagine this place as being like the same radius, corner radius, but, but the thing being flat. The cars would be going a lot slower. So don't let the banking intimidate you. Like just use it to your advantage. Like the banking is your friend. And uh, it wasn't so friendly in the first year. <laughs> but uh, throughout my years in IndyCar, I always remembered what Eddie told me. And, and uh, I, I guess I just kept getting better, better and better at it. And uh, uh, until, I don't know, until I, I finally won my, 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 my first race on a novel, which was, which was a bunch of years later. <laughs> <laughs> so after you do, um, you know, the indie stuff, you, you, I know you do, you do some NASCAR stuff and then obviously you get into sports cars. What was that training system like going from, you know, a single seater open wheel car to drive in NASCAR and then to drive in sports cars? Um, 
throughout my career, I had driven a little bit of covered wheels here and there. <laughs> but um, what was it like? It wasn't a big difference because at the end of the day, a race car is a race car. It's going to push or it's going to be loose. And no matter if you're driving a go-kart, if you're driving a, a Formula 3 or a Formula 2, whatever, an Indy car, a Formula 1, uh, touring cars, sports cars, you're always going to have the same fundamental problems, okay? And uh, I guess you just need to try and adapt the best way as possible uh, to the car and um, try to get the job done. Don't make any mistakes out there. I don't know why I I loved endurance racing. Uh, I don't know if it's because of the time that you stay in the car driving, whatever it is. But uh, um, as soon as I started doing a little bit more of it, I, I always went well in, in endurance races. Like uh, I won the Spa 24 Hours back in 93. Then I won with my dad. There's a thousand mile race in Sao Paulo that was in 94 that happened. So uh, obviously in those days, I wasn't fully committed to, to sports cars, but uh, I had had glimpses of, of, um, of, of good performances in, in sports cars already uh, in the past. But, but my career was completely devoted to single seaters in those days. The, uh, he he kind of touched on it, and I, I do hate to bring it up, but this this stock car deal seemed like it was a rough go. Um, it was, and uh, I mean, again, this is ifs and buts. I mean, was it it was or was it just one of those things where you just couldn't find the rhythm of it, or just you weren't meshing well with the teams, and they weren't they didn't understand what you were looking for, or. I, I guess, like, my only experience with them was pretty much with, um, I ran in in Bush a little bit with um, George Debitar's team. I, I, I forgot the name of it. and uh, But um, that was in the Mike Hard Lemonade car. Mm-hmm. Um, I made it in my first race. Um, then we even did some good, like in St. Louis, I qualified, I think, fourth or fifth. So we had some speed. I didn't do a lot of races with them. About I ended up doing, I think, two or three. And then I fall into my petty experience, which... Uh, yeah, what are you going to say about the king? Like, the king is the king. Like, the the the, the guy was magical uh, in his days. Like, there's no there's no doubt about it. And um, uh, Kyle was, was obviously a lot involved, like, with the team, and he was still driving in those days. And, and the ideas that we all had, they looked to make sense to everyone. Like, going through a ABC program, which was uh, ARCA, Bush, Cup, but the money really never showed up. And uh, right. the whole ARCA idea turned into a one race, <laughs> which was only Daytona, which again, I think we qualified fourth or fifth. And then I ended up finishing seventh in the race, I think. But that was, I think, my only start. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I went to Pocono. I did an under race there in Pocono. I qualified third. And I think I had mechanical problems right in the beginning of the race. Um, and then suddenly when I opened my eyes, they threw me in a cup car where, where I wasn't really prepared for it. I'm going to be honest. It was a combination of two things. I wasn't prepared and the team wasn't prepared to perform also. Like the the team was was okay, but it, it wasn't doing great. So I I couldn't give the correct feedback to the team of what I needed in the car. So it wasn't helping me as a driver. And at the same time, the team wasn't 
being developed because because of me, but the standard of the team, because they were not performing really that high. Like, unfortunately, I didn't have competitive material. So it, it was it was hard to get the whole interaction rolling uh, very well. And and obviously, no need to say that uh, uh, our contract was for three years, but after a year and a half, uh, it all came to an end. Sure. I, I loved Richard Perry growing up as a kid. Like he was one of my idols. Uh, but I will tell you that I it, it isn't like the team had many better finishes once you got out of the car <laughs> during that time period, you know? So uh, it's, uh, I think that's a fair way to look at it. It's a, it's unfortunate. Um, you know, just timing's everything, right? Oh, yeah. I, I guess time is everything in life not only right. for a race car driver like uh, sometimes there are things that fall on your lap and and i think the most important lesson that i learned throughout my whole i wouldn't even say racing career but throughout my whole life is you need to be ready to capitalize on the luck situations and not let the luck situations just go by you if you're prepared to take advantage of it you did your homework correctly and you're going to take advantage of it. And, and that's going to trigger a lot of other opportunities in your life. If you're not prepared, then uh, I don't think it's right on your side to start complaining about, Oh, what if, what if, what this and that and everything, because luck went by you a couple of times throughout your life and you weren't ready to, 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 to grab it by the horns and, 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 right. and pretty much take advantage of it. Right. Uh, we know you, you, uh, you have to run your time's limited. What is. No, no, actually when we started, uh, like, we can extend because I just got a text from my daughter and, <laughs> and for some reason it's going until eight twenty today. So like we okay. can extend another 20 minutes. All right, cool. <laughs> hey, sounds good to me. You're yeah, up I can here. talk for hours. So, um, yeah. What? So, Oh, I lost my train of thought there. <clears throat> <clears throat> so what, so when you look at, I guess, racing today, I mean, do you, do you ever, wish that you got to race maybe in a different era like i mean what are your thoughts kind of on racing today um, i mean obviously it's safer yeah but i agree and disagree with you i agree yes it's safer but i disagree with you because 20 years down the road the the, the current drivers are going to look back and they're going to say wow those guys that were driving in 2015 or whatever the yeah, year was 2020 true. They were cuckoo. They they were completely crazy. How come they didn't (laughs) have the safety device? They didn't have this. But again, that's part of living and learning. It it goes beyond anything. So it's part of living and learning. and, And there's not a lot that we can say apart from trying to make the, the sport safer and, and trying to evolve as, as, as fast as we can. Did you, so, I mean, obviously you don't, I mean, I don't know if you, I know you're, you retired from sports car racing after a very successful career. Um, do you do anything at all in motorsports right now? You uh, work for that team, yes. right? Action. Uh, consulting. No, no, okay. not for action. I, I actually work for Mustang Sampling. That's right. Which has been a, a, a very good sponsor of uh, ours since, uh, 2015 starting with action express and then uh three or two years at the end of um so 20 at the end of 19 we yeah at the end of 19 we left action express and then we joined um jdc so we ran 2020 21 and we're currently on our third season uh with them right now I've seen the name a million times. What is Mustang Sampling? I mean. 
Oh, uh, I mean, I, maybe, I mean, I, I just don't know what what it is. I, I've seen the name a zillion times, but I don't know what they okay. do or. Yeah, basically, uh, natural uh, natural gas. They okay. they do in, they do measurement and sampling uh, instruments for natural gas. I didn't know that. Yes. And, now and they I know. have been like for many, many years, uh, Ken Thompson and his wife, Brenda, have been very, very successful in the business. Well, you would have to be the <laughs> sponsor of the, the cars that they sponsor. That's for sure. You know, oh, uh, yeah. we had we had Mario on here, uh, kind of going back a little bit what we were talking about earlier. We had Mario on here. and uh, Of course, Mario race in the, the wide open days of the sport. I mean, you know, whatever ideas, you know, you could come up with, you know, you ran. Um, and he was saying that he would have rather have run today where the cars are basically even and the motors are essentially even because he wouldn't have had the mechanical failures that he experienced when, you know, when they were running, when he ran at the time and, and they were running everything on the edge and you just were trying new parts all the time and you know how it goes. Um, when you look at that, do you like, cause I, I've talked to a few different guys in his age group and uh, some of them are very much of the, they like the, the IndyCar format as it is today where it's, you know, Roughly everything's the same. I mean, obviously they're not identical, but they're roughly the same. And other guys would rather be like the older days where everybody had could come up with their own ideas. What is there? Do you fall in between in that, or do you lean one way or the other? Um, I don't run the indie cars nowadays, so it's hard for me to to judge exactly what's happening today. Uh, I, I, I can judge it as an ex-driver, as someone that has been around the sport for a long time and has learned a lot with the sport, but not as a driver. Um, what I can say is I really enjoyed my years in IndyCar when you had different manufacturers, like not only engines, but car manufacturers. Then we had a tire war um firestone and uh for example goodyear so all of that i enjoyed a lot um and it's completely different to what they have nowadays it's pretty much the same chassis for everyone and you have two different engines and the same tire for everyone so right. I'm not going to say it's boring because it, obviously it's not boring. It's extremely competitive. You can see when the cars qualify, like uh, they're, they're very, very close. Like the whole grid is really, really packed and you can see the races. Like it's very easy for you to go to, from the front of the pack to the back and, and uh, vice versa. But uh, it's different. Uh, it's different in the sense that yeah, it's it's all almost like a single make uh, racing, and uh, I personally I, I liked it a lot when when Reynard was running against a Penske, that was running against a Lola, that was running against a Swift, like the, the different chassis. I, I I think it added a lot to the sport. On top of that, you had the different engines, and then on top of that, you had different tires also the, the, that that made it uh really really cool but um having said that it's it is what it is nowadays and and the only thing i can say is that it's extremely competitive nowadays yeah and that's that's kind of why i hear like um like i said from some of the people i've talked to um you know they're like hey i love I lived it when it was wide open and we could do our own things and, and all that. And, and like I said, then, you know, like Mario, some like Mario and there's been a couple others said, yeah, I'd rather run today. I just run flat out. And I, you know, it's, it's all, you know, in his opinion, more driver, you know, like he felt like 
he, he would have the reliability to match his driving skills. So I, I think that's an interesting thought though. I, and part of me, you know, as, as a, as a fan, obviously I, I like, I like the wide openness, but I understand the checkbook side of why they do what they do. You know, it's, it's cheaper. I mean, in theory, at least it's cheaper to do how they're doing it now. So, um, but I, I definitely, I, I, I get both sides of it. And when you look at like sports car racing today, I mean, that that's kind of what we were talking about being, I mean, kind of being wide open where, I mean, look how many different main, I don't even know the number, but just look at all the manufacturers and, you know, cars that are in IMSA. And I know next oh, yeah. year they're changing some stuff with the rules. Right. And I know some like the European teams will be coming over. Yeah, uh, next year I think we're going to start a new era in in uh, IMSA. Uh, obviously, uh, we're going to have uh, a little bit of uh, hybrid um, systems like uh, in the cars, and we're going to have a lot of manufacturer involvement. In one way, I think it's very good. In the other way, I don't think it's that good because I think they're pretty much going to take away the, the opportunity for privateers because suddenly the the, the 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 running the operational costs of the car are going to be a lot higher and um, it's okay for a manufacturer but it's not so okay for a privateer <laughs> which uh, financially um, has a, a, a much harder time coming up or or going after the money than uh, a manufacturer has a manufacturer pretty much writes the check and let's go racing and when 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 they accomplish what they wanted to accomplish in the sport and they don't want to race anymore they pretty much look at you and say okay thank you very much it was a pleasure i loved it and then they pull out of the sport um so yes in in some ways it, it's how you evolve the sport it's how you 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 make it stronger and a lot of people are going to learn with with the manufacturers coming in there's no doubt about it and it's going to be extremely competitive but um mark my words i'm i'm, I'm pretty sure that it's going to go like a cycle and and manufacturers are going to be involved for whatever three five six years and then once the first one pulls out, the second one is going to come out, this, the third one, and, and, and then we're going to go back to the privateers uh, again. And then that, that cycle is going to slowly start creeping up again until <laughs> we gather the interest of four or five manufacturers again. Then it's going to become a manufacturer party and the privateers will have to get out of it. But um uh, that's the way it is. Like there isn't anyone at fault. Uh, it's just cycles. I have seen that throughout my racing career a couple of times, and I'm pretty sure that the same thing is is, is going to happen again. But uh, right now, IMSA is is, is entering a, 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 a I would say um, a period of of a lot of. Uh, how can I say it? Uh, a lot of um, richness for the fans. I, I, I think it's going to be very interesting the next couple of years, especially for the fans. And uh, I think a lot of uh, a lot of people are are going to be able to uh, benefit themselves out of it. But uh, how long is that going to last? Uh, like everything in life. Uh, the only thing that we're sure of is that one day we're all going to die. Apart from that, no one's sure of nothing else. <laughs> yeah, no, no one's outrun that yet. So, <laughs> it's uh, what do you have? You uh, of course, um, we we've had kind of small discussions about this in the past and uh, with other guests, and obviously more and more electric type racing is coming online have you ever driven uh in the any form of electric race car no no yeah i wasn't sure if you if, got I, testing if, or... if, if, if if i had to maybe i would but uh 
I'm not interested. My background doesn't come from that. And I love the smell. I love the noise. I, I think it's yeah. completely related to racing. And it's hard for me to visualize 100 to 300,000 people sitting on the stands and a gag of 30 to 40 cars going by you and you talking to your neighbor that's sitting right <laughs> next to you uh, because there's zero noise out there. Uh, to me, I don't know. It's not, it's not racing, but uh, maybe I'm getting too old to try and understand that new mentality or thought process that apparently is coming up. You probably yeah, done I'm like right um, you. I'm you right done like you, Christian. You probably done like K1 speed go karts before, right? Is there a yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. It's it's not the yeah. same. I I prefer definitely get no, over the Yeah, it, it's not the same and was it fun? No, it wasn't fun, but uh, <laughs> again, <laughs> Maybe we're going into an era right now that um, that uh, is is different, and 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 I guess it's one of those things that you just have to get used to it. If you don't get used to it, then you shouldn't be you're playing there. You we should think about doing something else, like going fishing or whatever, do, 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 doing something else because it's not it's not part of your game anymore. Outside of the F1 car, and, and have you driven uh, a, a various different race cars in your life? Like, I know I know you've driven F1. I know you've driven the different stock cars. I know you've driven Indy cars. But have you uh, have you done anything outside of that that's different, like any off-road racing or rally racing, anything like that? No, never. Like, a rally, off-road, those, like, those those type of racing they they definitely uh, entice me a lot but have i ever given it a go no uh, i have never tried it before um i think if i if i have the accurate or or the appropriate uh, testing time uh yeah maybe it could be something fun but uh answering your question directly no i have never driven those type of cars before yeah, I didn't know. You know, it's funny. We, we've had a, a surprisingly amount of guests on here who've done a lot of off-road racing. and uh -huh, yeah. People, and, uh, we, we had no idea ever did it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so, random question. So, were you in the movie? Um, you were in the movie Driven a little bit, right? Uh, no, I think they only mentioned. No, we weren't. Uh, Driven was the one with Stallone, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, 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 we weren't. They only oh, okay. mentioned, I think that there was a mention of my, Michael's name and my name, but uh, we never participated in the movie itself. Well, we've talked to a few guests who are, were, are would wish they hadn't been in that movie. So <laughs> if you were the lucky ones, <laughs> you know, to be fair to it, it's a movie, right? Um, it brought I exposure mean, to racing. I don't know if it was good right. exposure. There's but... in the world. <laughs> the, well, uh... There's always that saying, right, Aaron? Uh, talk good or talk bad, but talk about me. So, yeah, That's maybe right. it was, at the end of the day, maybe it was something positive for racing. But, uh, like, movies about racing, there's only one. And that's uh, 24 Hours of Le Mans, in, in uh, my opinion. Like, like the rest is the rest. Uh, I, I, Le Mans was really cool, and and I think I watched that movie about eight hundred and twenty-two <laughs> million times when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah, no, great movie. You, you were in Super. I think you were involved in Super Speedway a little bit, right? Or was that before your time? Sorry, with Super Super Speedway, the Mario and Michael movie. Yes. No, no, no. That was exactly when I was coming in. They were shooting that that movie. It was a uh, IMAX movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, like um, if we if we think that. Um, when was it that was shot in 90 from 95 to 96, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah, and 
I, I think that they did an awesome job considering that that was like almost, wow, time flies, almost 30 years ago. That's so crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's crazy seeing the, the video of Mario driving with that big, huge um, camera on the car. And now it's just a little, little bitty camera. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, a little bit of camera technology, probably that thing would run out of film in two seconds and batteries and this and that. And and right now with something a lot smaller, you can shoot for a lot longer, much better quality, everything, <laughs> everything. Does, uh, do you have any, I mean, obviously you still around racing some, have you had any other type of interest or hobbies over the years? that you really found the equaled racing or, or at least were something to, to kill time between racing? Well, I never saw racing as a hobby for me. Like racing right, was right, right. I didn't always like a, a, yeah, yeah, no, 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 like a profession. And um, sure. uh, I started riding bikes a long time ago and, and I got into mountain biking, which translated into like uh, enduro stuff and, and more downhill enduro stuff, which which is what I do a lot nowadays. And, and I also dig a lot. So um, I try to ride as much as I can. Like uh, sometimes when I'm driving from, from one place to the other, just always carry my bike with me, just stop somewhere, go and ride and and put it back in the car and, and continue driving. And there are a couple of places I ride uh, close to my house, but which is in Florida, that's flat, but believe it or not, the, the trail system in Florida is, is, is very good, uh, but it's flat. It's, it's not ideally what you want to be doing. Uh, obviously you want to be going down mountains and, uh, <laughs> When I'm not here in Florida, I try to travel as much as I can, and and I go around, actually around the world to to ride. So, um, name the places like obviously Canada, uh, Scotland, Brazil, uh, Italy, France, like a, a bunch of places all over the world that I have. I have had the opportunity to go riding, which were very, very cool. Yeah, I just started mountain biking last year, and I absolutely love it. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do now. What do you Sorry, think? Uh, no, that's that's fine. Well, there's so many guys, especially guys that come out of single seater race cars, that uh, tend to tend to bike and a lot of mountain bike. What do you think it is about? I mean, is there some correlation? Is it just the challenge of it? Um, is it because you, your entire life, you've challenged yourself in that race car, pushing yourself to the limit? Is that what it is? Or, I mean, is there something that, that inherently draws somebody like yourself to it? Well, apart from the physical side of it, uh, a road bike, the only resemblance it has is pretty much when you're drafting, I think, uh, driving there's no really big techniques about driving a, a a bicycle on the road um when you start getting into it believe it or not is when you start going down uh big mountains and and you need to sort of apex the corners correctly you need to sort of judge by your speed and and by the, the amount of grip you have on the surface where are the correct braking points and this and that uh, I think because I was, I, I drove my, my whole life. I, I think that that helps me a lot or, or makes the sport a lot less hard for me because I have an idea of where I need to stab the brakes and, and how, like how I need to apex the corners and, and, and this and that, but still having said that every sport has its uh, uniqueness to it. And, uh, uh what can i say like it's i i started doing that when i was a lot older I, I think if i had started doing mountain bike and when i was in my teens or, or early 20s like uh it would have been a lot more fun but it didn't happen that way and, and <laughs> i guess i'm just trying to enjoy it the best way as possible right now but which which i i i really do like there 
there are very so very little weeks that at least once a week I'm I'm not on top of a bike. Like very very little weeks throughout the whole year. Um. So I I, I know you got to go here in a second, but if you do you have any ad- advice for I don't know up and coming drivers you know people are just starting racing what would be your biggest piece of advice you would give them never one day is like the other so and it works both ways if you have a good a good day uh, if you don't keep on trying your very best and concentrate to your maximum and uh, maximum potential the next day can be a disaster because it's 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 the nature of racing the same way happens the other way maybe you have a, a disastrous day today and you go on to the next race the following week and and you manage to win the race so uh, one day is never like the other in racing yes i understand that sometimes it's hard for you to understand that thought process because if you're with a team that's not performing that well like it's hard for you to turn it around from one week to the other but uh maybe you're you're not going to win the race but you're going to do a very strong race that's going to call someone's attention and then other opportunities are are going to arise and 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 maybe you you you're going to go with something else that you didn't have at that moment that's going to change your career so uh just think about it just because you had a, a disastrous day you have to turn the page and and focus for the next day because in racing it changes very very fast one day you're at the top and then the next day when you open your eyes you're at the very bottom or vice versa I think that's with life in general. I think that's great advice for life in general. Yeah, I agree. You, well, uh, yeah, but yeah, some sorry, professions, this, some some professions are are a little bit more stable than sure. than other uh, others. So <laughs> you, you you know you have that stability for maybe a year or two or three that you can sort of plan yourself. I don't really think that you have any stability in racing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No. No, you're that's that's the truth there. Yeah, and I think that goes back to what you said earlier about being prepared to take those opportunities when they come, right? I mean, it's all part yeah. of it. Yeah. All right. I, I I don't ask this every show, but uh Sug tells me you got a good one. Best racing story that you can share in public. Oh. <laughs> oh, that that's a couple of them. Like that's another I'll Half take an two. hour conversation. Well, no, I'll, I'll do take the following. No, 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 no. Like I'll, I'll, I'll change that. Uh, I really have to run because otherwise I'm going to get late to pick up my daughter. But if you guys ever invite me for another podcast, anytime, then, uh, I'll, I'll Absolutely. not only answer that, but I'll, I'll answer like whatever, whatever other questions you guys want to ask me. So let's let's hold off for a couple of months and. Um, Whenever you guys are ready again, like uh, it, it would be a pleasure to to join you guys uh, again, and and I'm sure I'm sure that we can continue talking, and we're gonna have a lot of a lot of uh, stuff to talk about. Absolutely, that uh, I like cliffhangers. We got a okay. part two cliffhanger. Okay, hey, Christian, great race car driver, great person. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. No, thank you guys so much. So uh, that's a deal already. We have a part two to our show. Uh, just just put it to sleep right now for a little bit. And, and then when you guys are not bored of me anymore, like uh, <laughs> uh, give me a call again. Uh, I sure don't think we'll. we'll be bored anytime soon. So, yep, uh, nope. But we will definitely call. Thank okay. you, sir. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.